question box on the GoToWebinar panel. And if you could send me a hi or hello, like Eric has already done in there, I would appreciate it. I want to make sure that you know where this is located because this is how we're going to accept questions throughout the webinar. There's quite a bit of content today, so the presenters have asked that you please, as your questions come up, send them in through the question box. And we do have a, another person who's on the line, Adam, who's going to be available to start answering those questions. And then when we get to the very end of the presentation, um, I know that Martin has said he will be happy to address um, questions as well through the audio. So thank you for everybody who's finding that um, box there and sending me a hi or hello or a good morning. I appreciate that. And thank you to the 95% of you who voted as far as where you, um, what type of agency or employer you work for. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll out real quick. While I'm doing that, I want to mention as well that the handout that you were sent um, a link to this morning is also available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. So if you didn't get a chance to download it from the link and you want to get it from the handout section, you can do that. I'll also be sending out a follow-up email with a link to hopefully the recording if technology cooperates and also a link to our the handout as well. So I shared the poll results. We have our largest contingency this morning is 49% from consulting firms, and then we have 29% from state government, 18 from local government, three from other, and one from construction firms. So I'll hide those poll results. Thank you for voting. 97% was a great response rate. Um, so Brenton, I believe the things are all yours now. All right, um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, which will cover ODOT's new analysis and traffic simulation manual, better known as the OATS manual. Um, I'm Brent Bogart, administrator in the Office of Roadway Engineering at ODOT's central office. Um, Adam Koenig, assistant administrator and studies engineer, is also joining me today. You may jump in with some additional information. We'll help answer any questions you guys submit through the chat box. Um, in today's webinar, you will be introduced to the OATS manual with the goal of learning how the manual is organized, what topics are covered, where to find more detailed information, and to gain an understanding in what has changed in ODOT's traffic analysis requirements as a result of publishing the OATS. Uh, the OATS manual was published in July, just over a month ago, with the intent to establish uniform methodologies for performing traffic analyses and traffic simulation for ODOT projects. The objective of this manual is to achieve consistency in traffic analysis for all ODOT projects. Uh, consistent and reliable results allow for a more accurate comparison between projects, which can help with decision making regarding the needs for funding and improvements across the state. Uh, the information in the OATS manual supersedes or replaces the information previously published in the ODOT location and design manual. The OATS manual is divided into nine chapters. Each of these chapters are covered by at least one video, which can be found on Roadway Engineering's studies webpage. The first chapter, Traffic Analysis Scoping, describes the components of the ODOT analysis scoping document. Uh, setting spatial and temporal analysis limits is detailed in Chapter 2, Traffic Analysis Limits. Chapter 3, Analysis Tool Selection, designates which analysis tool should be used based on the conditions of the study site. Data needs and field collection methods are detailed in Chapter 4, Data Collection. In chapter 5, General Traffic Analysis, contains information regarding typical analysis inputs and factors. Chapter six provides a guide to using the Highway Capacity Software, or HCS, and the methodologies in the Highway Capacity Manual. Quick guides on the inputs, as well as details on using HCS streets, stop control, roundabouts, highways and freeway facility, facilities modules are also included in this chapter. A guide to using Transmodeler is provided in chapter seven. Chapter eight summarizes how analysis results should be presented in technical reports for easy review. And lastly, the required documentation is detailed in chapter nine. Um, as part of the documentation, 
a form will be required to be submitted on all projects to summarize the data inputs and the deviations from default inputs. Uh, this document will also be used to summarize the calibration and validation outside of the technical memorandum. A reviewer's checklist is also included in this chapter. Um, and this form will be used by the district and Office of Roadway Engineering to review the analyses, but can also be used by analysts performing an internal review prior to submitting. Um, and again, each of these chapters have at least one dedicated video that further explain each chapter's contents. So here is the link to the studies page where the training video playlist can be found. Um, several short how-to videos were also created for chapters six and seven to supplement guidance on HCS and Transmodeler. And if you downloaded the handout attached to um, the, the little sidebar um, thing, you should be able to just click the link and follow that. Um, the traffic analysis scope is the foundation for a solid traffic analysis and is covered in chapter one. A properly prepared traffic analysis scope documents the assumptions and methodologies to be used for the analysis. Um, it can also be used to help prepare the estimates for performing the work. Uh, the traffic analysis scope should be tailored to the complexity of the project. A simple rural intersection would be scoped much differently than an urban interstate with a system interchange. The scope should also be used to raise concerns and to resolve them early in the process. And some of these resolutions may lead to changes in the analysis, which can be accounted for in the scoping process prior to the fee development, which can prevent a fee modification later in the analysis. The traffic analysis scoping document is prepared by the ODOT district project manager prior to the development of the consultant's fee proposal. It should be reviewed and approved by the Office of Roadway Engineering for projects that will involve ORE. These projects include interchanges, interchange studies, um, which include interchange justification, modification, or operation studies, uh, feasibility studies involving interchanges, and AERs involving interchanges. Most importantly, the traffic analysis scoping document must be completed in advance of the early coordination meeting with modeling and forecasting as it could affect their work on the project. The scoping document is a six page PDF form available on ORE's website through the link uh, provided a few slides back. Each of the elements listed on this slide are included in the scoping document. And many of these elements have dedicated sections in the OATS manual that include specific details that can be used as reference when filling out a scope. Each of these items are discussed in more detail in the module one traffic analysis scoping training video as well. So there are now two types of traffic analyses, standard and complex. The majority of the projects will be the standard type. These types of analyses use the default values from the software packages like saturation flow rates or other easily obtained data and have minimal calibration and validation needs. Nearly all highway capacity software or HCS analyses and most small transmodeler analyses will be the standard type. Complex type projects will require the analysis of existing conditions so that the model can be calibrated to match real life conditions. As a result, the data collection can be labor intensive, especially since the model does not use as many default or standard values as the standard analysis type. Large freeway corridors with multiple interchanges and other high risk projects are examples of complex analysis types. The minimum study boundary for analyses per performed in urban areas are stated in the State Highway Access Management Manual for traffic impact studies and the traffic uh, academy manual for interchange studies it covers the boundary limits for interchange justification, modification, and operation studies. Um, analysis boundaries for corridor studies that do not include an interchange will include at least the first adjacent signalized intersection on either side of the study intersections. ODOT recognizes the potential benefits of multi-period analysis. But ODOT's requirement 
uh, is that all traffic analysis be conducted as a single analysis period, which is considered to be one hour. The use of multi-period analysis may be required in a future update to the OATS manual. Uh, it is also critical that the analysis limits be consistent across all alternatives, including the no-build alternatives, so that the system metrics, such as vehicle hours of travel, vehicle hours delay, and travel time can be compared when using Transmodeler. There are several instances when the spatial boundary expands past the minimum limits. Bottlenecks that affect traffic flows into or out of the study area. To the extent possible, the analysis boundary should be free of congestion. Bottlenecks outside the minimum analysis limits should be included to determine the impacts within the study area when the bottleneck is removed. Cues at, a, at study intersections that extend past the minimum limits. So similar to bottlenecks, the analysis area should encompass the queuing to determine the impacts when the queuing is alleviated. Major system service interchanges just outside the minimum boundary limits. These large interchanges could affect the lane changing behavior in the study area and should be included in the model limits. Existing undersaturated condition that could become oversaturated by the design year. Expansion of the analysis boundary should be considered to ensure the model limits will be undersaturated in the design year. Adjacent intersections, because of being part of a coordinated system, may affect the formation of vehicle platoons along the arterial. If the project is within an arterial with signal coordinated system, the analysis boundary should be extended to the extent possible to include the effect of coordinated signals. Highway Capacity Software, commonly called HCS, is a computer program that implements the HCM methodologies both HCM and HCS analyze capacity and LOS for uninterrupted flow and interrupted flow roadways. Other travel modes covered by the HCM and HCS are pedestrian, bicycle, and transit. Results from signalized intersection analyses created by HCS can be directly exported to Transmodeler software. Unlike the equation-based methods of HCS, Transmodeler uses microsimulation to analyze all types of roadway networks. Transmodeler uses car following and driver behavior logic to simulate the traffic operational behavior of various geometric conditions as traffic volumes and speeds fluctuate. Several measures of effectiveness can be obtained from the analysis, including some comparable to the methodologies in HCM. While HCS and Transmodeler are both great tools for analysis, there are benefits to using one tool over the other. ODOT standards requires that HCS be used for all analyses except for conditions where HCS cannot adequately analyze project elements. A flowchart is provided to help analysts select the appropriate tool as illustrated here. So the first question refers to analyses that are part of PDP Path 5 projects or other high profile projects. Uh, for projects under public scrutiny or where public involvement is critical to the success of the project, visualization may be helpful. With the analysis and transmodeler, public ready graphics and videos can be created to help the public and other stakeholders understand the proposed improvements and how they will affect traffic flow within the study area. When selecting the appropriate tool, it is important to determine if the study area contains any of the following features, mix of intersection control types, uneven lane distribution, oversaturated areas um, that are impractical to expand, and closely spaced intersections. Uh, corridors often have a mix of intersection control traffic, uh, traffic control types. In some cases, adjacent intersections significantly impact each other. An example could be a signal metering traffic approaching a nearby stop controlled intersection. Uh, what is happening? Uh, Victoria, is my screen flickering? It is not. It's holding steady for us. We saw that okay. you exited out back to the main screen with the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, it was kind of doing it by itself. So um, hopefully okay. it's fine now. Oh, there, yeah. Is it doing it again? 
No, it's not flickering on our end. Okay, well, it is a mine, I'll try to ignore it. Sorry about that. Sorry. Right. Additionally, um, mixing roundabouts and signals on a corridor could result in queuing through the roundabout. In such situations, transmodel Actually, can Brenton, be used. I, I hate uh -huh. to interrupt you, but I got a couple of messages for people that said that it was flickering on their end. Okay, so, hmm. um, it, it's holding steady right now. Yeah, let's keep going and hopefully okay. it won't do it anymore. Sorry about that. I don't know what's, right. I didn't press anything. Um, it's just the all internet. Right. <laughs> all right, while HCS can account for uneven lane distribution, Transmodeler can measure the effects upstream of vehicles favoring one lane over another because of a downstream turn or lane drop. These situations include dual turn lanes, a lane drop a short distance downstream of an intersection, and interchange types such as a clover leaf where a large portion of the traffic will be in the rightmost lanes. Uh, when project areas are oversaturated and it is impractical to expand the analysis limits to undersaturated areas, transmodelers should be used, lengthening the project area by several, several miles or multiple interchanges or intersections is considered impractical. For closely spaced intersections, transmodelers should be used to evaluate the queues between the intersections to ensure that they do not impact upstream signals. When selecting the appropriate tool, it is important to understand if the study area needs to evaluate any of the following, system-wide measures of effectiveness, active transportation and demand management, or ATDM strategies, interactions between vehicles and transit, and, re and traffic rerouting. Uh, when system-wide metrics, such as travel times, average speeds, for the corridor or study area and vehicle hours delay are being evaluated, trans modelers should be used. These metrics are especially helpful when the segment or intersection specific levels of service do not adequately compare alternatives. For example, when all build alternatives are LOSF, travel time or average speed may be a better metric for comparing between alternatives. HCS cannot accurately analyze active transportation and demand management, such as ramp metering, and should be analyzed using Transmodeler. It should be noted that this type of application may be limited in Transmodeler SE and may require the full version of the software. Transmodeler should be used to accurately measure the effects of transit, stopping in the travel lanes or receiving priority of signals. Uh, using the origin destination matrix in Transmodeler, traffic can dynamically be rerouted through the roadway network. Uh, this application is especially critical when improvement options close or change access to freeway segments or add new connectors that may shorten the travel time or distance for some drivers. While these traffic volumes can be manually rerouted, it is time intensive when multiple alternatives are being evaluated and it requires the analyst to make several assumptions to estimate new paths. The analyst must determine if there are certain types of facilities present, interstate and arterial corridor interaction, alternative intersections, or weaving segments. HCS cannot analyze the interactions between freeway facilities and arterials. If the analysis of this interaction is critical, like measuring queue spillback onto the mainline freeway, transmodelers should be used. The results from Transmodeler for complex intersections are more reliable than those from HCS. Such, intersections type, such intersection types include diverging diamond interchanges, continuous flow intersections, R-cut intersections, five-legged intersections, and three-lane roundabouts. While HCS can evaluate weaving sections, Transmodeler should be used to supplement the HCS results whenever HCS results in level of service F. When used just to supplement weaving sections, only the freeway direction containing the weaving segment and the weave itself should be analyzed in Transmodeler. It is not necessary to model the entire traffic analysis area in Transmodeler for this situation. If Transmodeler is used for one alternative, it should be used for all alternatives, including no build conditions, to provide an equal comparison between alternatives. If Transmodeler has been selected as the appropriate analysis tool, 
and the entire project area is modeled in Transmodeler, HCS is not required. Both HCS and Transmodeler can be used on the same project. If, for example, the project involved a freeway section with multiple interchanges but had one weave, the entire network analysis could be done using HCS, and Transmodeler could then be used to verify and supplement the results from HCS for the weave segment. Uh, the FHWA Traffic Analysis Toolbox cautions against comparing simulation results to the HCM-derived results. Rather, the analyst should review the software documentation to understand the differences between and be sure that the microsimulation software is calculating the level of service properly. Based on discussions with the Transmodeler software developer Caliper, it was determined that Transmodeler appropriately presents the level of service results consistent with the highway capacity manual methodologies. For basic analysis of mainline freeways, merges, diverges, and arterial intersections and segments, the results between HCS and Transmodeler are consistent. For weaving segments, results can vary greatly between HCS and Transmodeler. Transmodeler. Therefore, all weaving analysis from HCS resulting in LOSF should be supplemented with Transmodeler. In summary, HCS is required for all analyses except for conditions where HCS cannot adequately analyze project elements as detailed in chapter three of the OATS manual. If Transmodeler is used in one alternative, it should be used for all alternatives. If Transmodeler is selected as the appropriate tool and the entire project area is modeled in Transmodeler, HCS is not required. Both HCS and Transmodeler can be used on the same project, and all weaving analysis from HCS resulting in LOSF should be supplemented with Transmodeler. Chapter four of the OATS covers the data collection needed to perform different types of analyses. A series of tables were developed in the OATS manual to summarize the data needs for each facility type for signalized and unsignalized intersections, which includes ramp terminal intersections, the intersection geometry and configuration must be identified. The number of lanes on each approach, lane markings and turn lane lengths can be measured from aerial maps of Google Street View and confirmed with field reviews as appropriate. Turning movement counts could be obtained from ODOT TMMS or other local sources, uh, provided that the data is not older than three years. If they need to be collected, counts should be obtained on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday on weeks that do not contain a holiday. Counts including vehicle classifications should be collected in 15-minute intervals between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m. Segments, segment counts should be collected if demand exceeds capacity at the intersection. For areas with high pedestrian activity, pedestrian counts should also be collected. Queue lengths should be collected on complex type projects when demand is known to exceed capacity. When performing existing conditions analyses at signalized intersections, existing signal timings should be obtained from the maintaining agency or field measured if timings are not available. Lane utilization should be field measured for a 15 minute period during the analysis period at locations where lanes are not equally utilized. When analyzing an urban or rural corridor, the roadway geometry and configuration in terms of speed limits and numbers of lanes should be obtained using aerial maps or Google Street View and verified in the field as appropriate. The signalized and unsignalized intersection data should be assembled according to the needs summarized previously. For complex type projects, the average speed and travel time should be obtained using NRICS or streetlight data or field measured if the data is not available. The free flow speed for these corridors is determined by adding five miles an hour to the posted speed limit. This table summarizes the data needs for conducting a freeway analysis, including facilities, basic, merge, diverge, and weave segments. The speed limits, numbers of lanes, auxiliary lanes, merge, diverge, weave locations, weave lengths, and acceleration and deceleration lengths should be obtained from aerial mapping in Google Street View and also confirmed in field reviews, field reviews as appropriate. The ramp terminal intersection information sh should be obtained according to the needs summarized previously. Mainline traffic counts can be obtained from ODOT continuous counters. Uh, if required, counts must be collected 24 to 48 hours in 15 minute intervals on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday during a week without a holiday. For complex type projects, average speeds and travel times should be obtained using NRICS or Streetlight. 
and if not available through these data sources, they may be field measured. And again, free flow speeds are calculated by adding, adding five miles an hour to the posted speed limit. Chapter five of the OSMANL provides details on the typical inputs that go into the traffic analyses for ODOT projects when default values should and shouldn't be used, as well as guidance on calibration and validation. Uh, grade should be considered whenever it exceeds 3% for longer than half a mile. For most cases, the default grade should be level. For locations where the grade exceeds 3% for longer than a half mile, the actual grade should be used for the analysis. If grades cannot be field measured, they can be estimated using Google Earth, and grade for ramps should be assumed to be zero. Traffic flow rates typically vary over the course of an hour. The peak hour factor is a measure of the traffic demand fluctuations within the analysis hour. The peak hour factor is calculated by dividing the total hourly volume by four times the volume during the peak 15 minutes of the peak hour. A peak hour factor of one indicates that the traffic volume in every 15 minute interval is the same and therefore the traffic flow is consistent through the hour. Peak hour factors over 0 0.95 are often indicative of high traffic volumes, sometimes with capacity constraints on flow during the peak hour. Lower peak hour factors indicate more variable traffic flows and that the traffic volume has a spike during the peak 15 minute intervals. The spike typically occurs in locations with highly peak demands such as schools and factories during shift changes. Peak hour factors in urban areas generally range from 0 0.80 to 0 0.98. For ODOT projects, the existing year peak hour factor should be calculated for all intersections from collected traffic counts. The peak hour factor should be calculated for the intersection as a whole and not individual approaches or movements. The minimum peak hour factor should be 0 0.80 unless it is justified by peak demands. The peak hour factor for the design year is assumed to be the same as the calculated peak hour factor for the existing year. For mainline freeway segment, segments, a default peak hour factor of 0 0.94 should be used for all analyses. The ramp peak hour factor will be the peak hour factor calculated for the ramp terminal intersection. In the event that the project specific counts are not available, default peak hour factors of 0 0.94 for ramps and 0 0.92 for arterials should be used. For analyses conducted in HCS, the hourly volume and associated peak hour factor will be entered directly into the software. Peak hour factors are accounted for through various methods when conducting transmodeler analyses. First, the volumes could be entered in four 15 minute periods. Secondly, after entering the volumes, the appropriate peak hour factor can be entered using the turning movement table settings. Alternatively, when using origin destination, destination matrices, a curve-based time distribution based on the calculated peak hour factor can be created. Refer to chapter seven of the manual for more information. Only one peak hour factor for the entire project can be used with transmodeler software. A critical study intersection or high volume intersection should be selected to represent the study area. If the majority of the study area is freeway, the default peak hour factor of 0 0.94 should be used. And all peak hour factor calculations should be included in the report appendix. Saturation flow rate is the maximum number of vehicles from a lane group that can pass through the intersection during one hour of continuous green under the prevailing traffic and roadway conditions. Narrower travel lanes will likely provide reduced traffic flow rates and large numbers of trucks or buses will also reduce traffic flow rates, uh, saturation flow rates. Um, default saturation flow rates should be used for the analysis. For urban areas, the default saturation flow rate is 1900 passenger cars per hour per lane while all other areas, the default saturation flow rate of 1,750 passenger cars per hour per lane. Urban areas are defined using the census urban areas boundary layer and the transportation information mapping system, commonly called TIMS, an attrib attribute for the UAT uh, YP10 of U indicates the urban area shown here in the figure. 
saturation flow rate is a direct input into HCS, while HCS allows for different saturation flow rates for each intersection movement, unless there is a specific reason to use different rates for different movements, which should be documented in the model documentation form, the same saturation flow rates should be used for all movements at the same intersection. In Transmodeler, direct entry of the saturation flow rate is not available. Refer to section 7.3.5.2 to determine how to make the necessary model changes to reflect the field measured saturation flow rate. When using HCS, right turns on red are not allowed and a zero value should be used for the right turn on red flow rate. At locations where right turn on red movements are a significant component for intersection operations, transmodeler should be considered. For channelized right turn movements that are yield controlled or free flowing and are not affected by queuing at the signal, the right turn demand should be included in the analysis. In most cases, channelized exclusive right turn lanes are not affected by queuing from the adjacent through lanes. When accounting for this demand in HCS, the unsignalized movement box should be checked and the value for the unsignalized delay should be zero. If the right turning analysis is, criti is critical to the study results, transmodeler should be used. Transmodeler can simulate right turn on red flow rates through car following and gap acceptance algorithms. However, va uh, visual inspection of the simulation should be performed to ensure the model matches existing conditions. ODOT defines a heavy vehicle as single unit trucks, buses, RVs, and tractor trailers, which are commonly referred to as type B and C. The percentage of heavy vehicles represents the count of heavy vehicles that arrive during the analysis period divided by the total vehicle count for the same period. The existing heavy vehicle percentage should be calculated based on existing counts. When calculating the heavy vehicle percentages for intersections, it should be calculated by approach and not for individual movements. In almost all analyses for ODOT, the existing heavy vehicle percentages will be the same in the future. If there is a reason to believe that the heavy vehicle traffic will be increasing at a different rate than passenger cars, the future heavy vehicle traffic percentages should be calculated. For example, if a truck, if a truck truck stop is planned within the study area, the number of trucks may increase at a different rate than passenger cars. This justification should be submitted to the ODOT project manager for approval. For HCS analyses, the heavy vehicle percentages should be calculated from the existing counts and entered directly into HCS. In Transmodeler, the vehicle fleet characteristics can be adjusted based on heavy vehicle percentages from existing counts. Refer to section 7.2.3.2 for information on how to adjust vehicle fleet characteristics in Transmodeler. The lane utilization adjustment factor accounts for the unequal distribution of traffic among the lanes in those movement groups with more than one exclusive lane. Lane utilization factors apply at locations with dual turn lanes or where a through lane drops a short distance downstream of an intersection. Another case would be an exclusive turn lane plus a shared through and turn lane. For example, this off ramp shown here has a three lane approach with a left turn lane, a shared left turn through right turn and right turn lane. Uh, by default, HCS will view the off ramp as a left turn lane through lane and right turn lane unless values are entered in the percent turns in shared lane input box. The existing lane utilization factors should be calculated from video or field observations. If the lane configurations do not change between existing and future conditions, the existing lane utilization factor can be assumed for future conditions. If one alternative changes the lane configuration, configuration such that the lanes uh, will be more evenly utilized, the default lane utilization factors can be used for future conditions. If the future condition involves a drop lane downstream of an intersection where the existing does not, the lane utilization for future conditions should be estimated. Calculations and justifications for the lane utilization estimation should be provided to the ODA project manager for approval. Very few projects are expected to need lane utilization factors estimated. 
For HCS analysis with dual lanes, the lane utilization data can be entered into the heaviest lane volume box of the detailed input data window in HCS. In cases of exclusive plus shared turn lanes, the percent of turns in the shared lane must be entered in the percent turns in shared lane box of the detailed input data window. The driver behavior parameters in Transmodeler and a properly coded roadway network will most likely reflect accurate lane utilization characteristics. Visual inspection should be performed to ensure that the simulation model matches the field conditions. If the model needs to be adjusted, the lane connector connectivity bias can be modeled in Transmodeler. Refer to section 7.3.5.2 for information on how to adjust these parameters. Signal timings play a vital role in the analysis and can drastically impact intersection capacity operations. For ODOT projects, the existing signal timing should be used whenever the existing signal analyses are performed. Refer to section 4.5 for more information on obtaining or measuring existing signal timings. Future year analyses should be conducted using optimized signal timings with the guidance provided in the following slides. Refer to section 6.2.2. Point one for signal timing inputs in, H, uh, in HCS in section 7.1.4.1 for Transmodeler. As part of the OATS manual, guidelines have been developed for optimizing signal timings for future year analyses. While they are just guidelines and not standards, deviations from these guidelines should be approved by ODOT on a project by project basis. Signal timing optimization can be performed in Synchro, HCS, or Transmodeler. However, no matter what software is used for optimization, the resulting signal timings should be entered into the software being used to conduct the traffic analysis. If the existing traffic signals are coordinated, they should be modeled as coordinated in the future year analyses. Cycle lengths in the future year analysis can differ from existing conditions, but should typically be between 60 and 120 seconds. Cycle lengths longer than 120 seconds may be required for intersections that are oversaturated. Cycle lengths at all intersections along a, corridor, a coordinated corridor must be the same. Half or double cycle lengths, such as having one intersection operate as 60 second cycle length, while the other signals have a cycle length of 120 seconds, is not permitted. If the intersection geometry changes between the existing and the future conditions, or if the clearance intervals or minimum timings are not known, the following values should be used. Yellow clearance of four seconds, all red clearance of two seconds, minimum green time for major street through movements of 20 seconds, minimum green time for minor street through movements 10 seconds, and minimum green time for protected left turn phases, seven seconds. Alternative intersections such as single point urban interchanges and diverging diamond interchanges can have a much wider intersection than traditional intersections. And in these cases, all red time may need to be longer than two seconds to allow additional time for a vehicle to clear the intersection. The minimum green times should be extended to accommodate walk and flashing don't walk intervals if required. Refer to chapter one for more information on when pedestrian timings should be included in the analysis. When pedestrian intervals are not known, assume seven seconds for the walk interval and 10 seconds for the flashing don't walk interval. Typically, left turn phases should be leading. However, sometimes lagging left turn phases can reduce vehicle delays. The lagging left turn phase is allowed only if the opposing left turn lanes are protected, only phases, and the queue for the lagging left turn movement does not impact the adjacent through lane. Protected permitted left turn phases ca cannot be lagging due to yellow trap. Based on the manu manual uniform traffic control devices, the yellow trap is a potentially adverse safety situation inherent in some signal phasing sequences involving lagging left turns in one direction. A left turning driver in the intersection waiting for gaps is on in oncoming traffic in order to turn left on a permissive green signal indication, sees the signal change from green to yellow and mistakenly assumes that the oncoming traffic also has a yellow signal at the same time and will soon be coming to a stop. This mistaken assumption 
traps the permissive left turner into thinking it is okay to safely complete the turn when in reality it is not safe because the opposing traffic continues to move on a green indication along with a lagging left turn and a severe crash can be the result. The operational goal for intersection analyses is an overall intersection LOS of D or better for locations within the boundaries of a metropolitan planning organization and LOS C or better for locations outside of an MPO boundary. Levels of service for each approach should be E or better and no indiv individual movement should have a volume to capacity ratio greater than 0.93. In addition, the Q storage ratio from HCS should be less than one for all movements. If the Q storage ratio goal cannot be met, transmodeler may be needed to determine if queuing impacts upstream intersections. When evaluating optimized signal timings, the minor street will often have more delay than the major street. This is acceptable, but the volume to capacity ratio for the minor street should be checked to make sure that this is not significantly higher than the major street volume to capacity ratio. In most cases, efforts should be made to ensure that the volume to capacity ratios for the minor street are not over one. A few minor tweaks in the signal timings can alter the VOC ratios so that the movements, uh, so that no movements are over one. It is understood that for oversaturated conditions, the volume to capacity ratios will be above one for both major and minor streets. For signal timing optimization guidance, please refer to Chapter 6 for HCS analyses and Chapter 7 for transmodeler analyses. Uh, calibration is a process that demonstrates that the model is a reasonably accurate representation of observed conditions. For example, if traffic is observed to queue between two intersections, the analysis model should also show this queuing. The model should be calibrated by modifying the model inputs or parameters until the model matches observed conditions. Validation is the act of proving or corroborating, usually with a second data source or data set that the calibrated model can also provide realistic results under different input data or scenarios. When validating the model, the analyst may compare the field measured average travel speed to the average travel speed generated by the model. The purpose of calibration and validation is to build confidence in the model as a useful predictor of operations that are likely to result from a condition that cannot be observed. For example, if an existing conditions model is properly calibrated and validated, when the traffic from a large mixed use development is added to the analysis, the results from the model are an accurate representation of operational conditions on the roadways surrounding the added development once it is constructed. Potential pitfalls of poor model development or poor calibration include, but are not limited to, discrepancies between field conditions and modeled conditions, and locations that have recently been constructed or improved. The aerial imagery used to build the model may not reflect the most recent conditions. Uh, analysts should verify the model inputs through field reviews. Unrealistic driving behavior, especially in transmodeler, the Lane utilizations in the model may not accurately reflect field conditions. Discrepancies between field measured traffic volumes and the amount of traffic served in the micro simulation model. In these cases, the traffic volumes collected may represent capacity and not demand. Creation of false bottlenecks. Uh, unrealistic driving behavior and miscoded models can create bottlenecks in the model that are not actually occurring. Um, unreasonable routings of vehicles through the network during dynamic assignment. When using the dynamic assignment in Transmodeler, vehicles may not use the route they are using in reality. Uh, this routing could be the result of signed routes in the field or other conditions that make the route faster under real, real world conditions than the modeled conditions. The formal process of calibration and validation is not required on standard type projects. However, a visual inspection uh, or logical output check should be performed to ensure models are an accurate rep representation of real world conditions. For example, from um, field observations, it is known that a queue from a signalized intersection 
regularly extends 1,000 feet from the intersection. If a visual inspection of the transmodeler simulation network or a review of the output does not show uh, a Q length of this magnitude, the model should be tweaked to match real world observed conditions. The measures selected for calibration and their targets for model calibration should be established based on the purpose and need of the project. The following list provides outputs and metrics that should be used to compare against field measurements to determine if a model is properly calibrated, including volume throughput, speed, travel time, and cues. For HCS analyses, it is recommended that cue lengths be used to calibrate the analysis model. At a minimum, it is suggested that volume throughput and speeds or travel times are used as metrics during, during transmodeler model calibration. Based on guidance from other states and FHWA at the time of publishing this manual, suggested calibration items and their targets are summarized in this table. Based on the individual movement flows, the volume throughput generated by the model should be within a certain threshold. When calibrating to speeds, the link speeds from the model should be within 10 miles an hour for more than 85% of the network links. Travel times from the model should be within one minute of field measured travel times for 85% of the network when field measured travel times are less than seven minutes. When field measured travel times are over seven minutes, the model travel times should be within 15% of the field measured times. Model queue lengths should be within 20% of field measured queue lengths and in general when queues are formed in the free flow areas in the field, the model should have queues in the same area. It is important to remember that HCS and Transmodeler have different input requirements. Only complex type projects requ require a robust calibration and validation process. However, standard type projects should be reviewed for logical and reasonable results compared to field observed conditions. Chapter six covers everything HCS, uninterrupted and interrupted flow applications, when to use HCS, performance measures, calibration and reporting and output. Chapter six also contains some convenient input guides that detail all the different input requirements for free, freeway facilities, streets, or signalized intersections, uh, roundabouts, all-way stop control and two-way stop control. There are also training videos for each of these intersection types as well as our cuts and DDIs on ORE's studies webpage. With the 2020 publication of the OATS manual, all freeway analysis performed for ODOT must be conducted using freeway facilities module and HCS in lieu of analyzing individual freeway elements separately. Analysis of individual elements may fail to capture potential bottleneck impacts at one segment on adjacent upstream and downstream segments. Additionally, the freeway facilities method computes performance measures for each of the individual's elements as well as the entire study area. So this is a fairly significant change um, and I did want to go through an example on how to do a fr freeway facilities analysis in HCS. The HCS freeway facilities training video covers the same example so that resources available to refer back to anytime you want as you are working on a project. So uh, this study area for this example includes State Route 315 corridor from north of Bethel Road interchange to the northern ramps at the North Broadway interchange. For the purposes of this example, only the northbound direction will be modeled in HCS. Similar steps and processes can be used uh, to analyze the southbound direction. The HCS files must be separated by direction. So in this case, there would be one uh, freeway freeways facilities file for the northbound direction and a second freeway facilities file for the southbound direction. So after opening HCS, click the freeways header. Uh, two more options will drop down, freeways and reliability. Click on freeways. Under the start header, click on the new file, or click on new file. This process may also be used to open recent files, which will be listed under the recent header or open other files by clicking on the open file under the start header. 
After clicking on the new file, this box will pop up. This is where the analyst is given the option to analyze the freeway elements individually through basic merge, diverge, or weaving segments, or through the freeway facility module. For ODOT projects, facility or facility by segmentation should be selected. This example will focus on using facility to build a network. For guidance using facility by segmentation, please refer to the HCS user guide. So the project file will open to this blank screen under the general tab. Under the project properties, the analyst should enter the information for the study. The global inputs are helpful when setting a uniform factor across all analysis elements. For example, in the OATS manual, the default peak hour factor of 0.94 should be used for freeway analyses. Instead of entering the peak hour factor for each individual element, the global input allows the analyst to use this page to set the peak hour factor for all elements. However, when first opening the file, there is only one segment. If the global inputs are applied at this time, it would only be applied to that segment. So the analyst should wait uh, to apply the general inputs until all segments have been entered. There are no prescribed guide guidelines on how the project properties information is populated. However, it is encouraged to be as descriptive as possible, especially in the analysis year and the time period analyzed. In this example, the analysis year includes both the year as well as the scenario, which in this case is the no build. Similarly, in the time period analyzed, both the peak period, in this case the PM, and the direction, which is northbound, are labeled. Proper labeling is especially helpful when multiple directions, alternatives, and analysis years are being evaluated. The next step in the analysis process is to segment the study area. When clicking on the segments tab, the analyst will see this screen. As previously discussed, there's only one basic segment in this file when it's created. The analyst must add the other elements and the next few slides will detail segmentation. So here's a stick diagram for the project. North is to the right on this slide. The figure is not to scale and is just being used for schematic purposes. The first step is to measure between the pane and nose of gores for each ramp. The easiest way to do this is using Google Maps. In this case, the distance between the nose of the gore, the North Broadway on-ramp and the Henderson Road off-ramp is 5,320 feet. On either end of the study area, the lengths of the freeway segments, segments should uh, be the distance to the next upstream and downstream ramps. If this length is not long enough contain, to contain the queue on these segments, it may be necessary to expand the study limits. The analyst should contact the Office of Roadway Engineering for directions should this condition occur. So the next step in the segmentation process, process involves determining the merge, diverge, and weave influence areas. This graphic is from Exhibit 10.1 in the Highway Capacity Manual and Figure 6.3 in the OATS Manual. The Highway Capacity Manual methodology establishes a defined influence area of 1,500 feet downstream of the junction with on-ramp and upstream of the junction with an off-ramp where interactions with the mainline traffic are affected. The influence area of the weaving segment is 500 feet both upstream of the on-ramp and downstream of the off-ramp. These influence areas along the mainline are accounted for in the merge, diverge, and weave analyses, not as part of the basic freeway segment. The analyst must calculate the new segmentation lengths accounting for these influence areas. To account for the influence areas, the merge, diverge, and weaving areas must be identified. The merge and diverge sections are indicated in purple on this figure. Um, there's a merge section at the North Broadway on-ramp and the Bethel Road on-ramp. There is a diverge section at the Henderson Road off-ramp. Um, all of these sections are 1,500 feet. There's a weave section between Henderson Road on-ramp and the Bethel Road off-ramp, and the influence area for each side of the weave is 500 feet. So identifying the segments, start with the 4,720 foot segment on the southern end of the study area on the left side of this diagram. That segment will be a basic freeway segment. Then there'll be a 1,500 foot merge segment for the North Broadway on-ramp. Next, the basic freeway segment between the North Broadway on-ramp and the Henderson Road off-ramp. 
is not the 5,230 feet as originally measured because there is a merge segment on the upstream section and a diverge segment on the downstream portion, the new length of the basic freeway uh, section is 2,320 feet, which is the original 5,230 minus the 1,500 feet from the North Broadway merge influence area and 1,500 feet from the Henderson Road, Henderson Road diverge influence area. Then there's the 1,500 foot diverge section to Henderson Road. Now the weaving segment between Henderson Road and Bethel Road has influence areas of 500 feet, both upstream and downstream of the weaving segment. Therefore, the basic freeway segment between the Henderson Road ramps is the original 2,200 feet minus 500 feet, which is 1,700 feet. The length of the weaving section shown in green is the originally measured 1,720 feet plus 500 feet for the downstream section and 500 feet for the upstream section, resulting in a total weaving segment length of 2,720 feet. The, the section between the Bethel Road ramps is a basic freeway segment. The length is the originally measured 2,480 feet minus the 500 feet that is part of the weaving segment, and the new length of the segment is 1,980 feet. Then there's the 1,500 foot merge section from the Bethel Road on ramp, shown here in purple. Lastly, the northernmost section will be the original 7,500 foot ba basic freeway segment minus the 1,500 foot merge section from the Bethel Road on ramp, or 6,000 feet. In total, this project has nine segments, five basic freeway sections, two merge sections, one diverge section, and one weaving section. Now that the study area has been segmented, we can go back to HCS, and the first step under the segments tab is to put the start time. The specific start time does not need to be coordinated with the actual peak hour. Defaults of 7 or 17 can be used as the AM or PM peak hours, respectively. For example, if the PM peak hour is from 5.15 to 6.15, it is acceptable to put the start time in HCS just as 17 or 5 o'clock, um, as long as the hourly volumes inputted into the program are from 5.15 to 6.15, the time in HCS does not matter. Um, it's helpful to be able to distinguish between analysis periods within HCS. In the first segment, uh, the type is basic freeway. The name for the segment should be entered. In this case, it is northbound State Route 315, south of North Broadway on-ramp. As previously discussed, the length of the segment will be the distance to the upstream ramp, in this case, at 4,720 feet. Um, there are three lanes in this section, and the demand volume is 5,570 vehicles per hour. Next, to add another segment, click on the Add segment. This will add a new segment below the first one. And now we will build the Merge segment. In the drop-down menu, there are multiple options, including the Merge option. After identifying this section as a Merge segment, the analyst has to provide the name of the element, which in this case is the North Broadway on-ramp. The length is automatically entered as 1,500 feet, and the number of lanes is still three, because it represents the number of mainline roadway lanes, not the number of lanes on the ramp. The demand cannot be modified within this window. It is automatically calculated based on the inputs and the details tab, which I will cover here shortly. Once the basic freeway segment between the North Broadway on-ramp and the Henderson Road off-ramp has been entered, the fourth element is the diverge segment to Henderson Road off-ramp. Again, the length is automatically determined to be 1,500 feet. The basic freeway segment south of Henderson Road on ramp can be entered. The next segment is the weaving segment. Similar to the diverge and merge segments, the weaving is an option on the drop down for the analysis type. The distance for this segment must be entered as there are no assumed distances like the merge and diverge segments. In this case, the number of lanes on the segment is four instead of three because of the auxiliary lane, which is contributing to the weave. So here is the completed segmentation in HCS. All nine segments have been entered and the graphic correctly illustrates the study network. Before moving on, it is important to discuss an instance where segmentation may not be as straightforward as presented in this example. An overlap area occurs when there is no auxiliary lane between an on-ramp and off-ramp, but they are closely spaced at least 1,500 feet 
but less than uh, 3,000 feet so that the influence areas overlap. This is illustrated in this figure. The distance between the two ramps is only 2,400 feet. So there's an overlap of 600 feet. Therefore, when entering this location into HCS, there would be a 900 foot merge segment, a 600 foot overlap segment, and a 900 foot diverge segment. Notice that the, these merge and diverge segment lengths differ from the default 1500 feet and will need to be manually entered in, into HCS. When entered correctly, the overlap length plus the merge or diverge length will equal 1500 feet. Here's what the situ situation would look like after being coded into HCS, including upstream and downstream basic freeway segments. Notice that the segment between the merge and diverge sections is not labeled as basic freeway, but rather as an overlap segment. So now that the segments have been created for the study area, we can revisit the global factor inputs on the general tab. The following global factors may be useful to modify. First, the area type is easily modified on this tab. The program defaults to an urban area type. So if rural freeway is being analyzed, this factor will need to be changed. Next, the freeway lanes can be set in this window if they were not set as part of the segmentation process. It is important to note that if the checkbox was selected for the number of freeway lanes, all segments will be modified to have three lanes, including the weaving section, which, is, which currently has four lanes. Um, if this button is toggled, the analyst should review the configurations under the details tab before performing the analysis to ensure that the number of freeway lanes are properly coded. The freeway free flow speed and peak hour factor are default values as defined in the OATS manual and the truck percentage for the freeway segments can be determined from count data. Similarly, the number of ramp lanes can be set globally, but care should be given to ensure that this factor is coded correctly under the details tab. The ramp free flow speed is the free flow speed of the vehicle at the merge or diverge point. For the purposes of ODOT analyses, this value uh, for most ramps is 15 miles per hour below the free flow freeway free flow speed. In this case, the ramp free flow speed is 55 miles an hour. The free flow speed of loop ramps could be lower than this default value, and the free flow speed at system ramps could be higher than this value. The ramp peak hour factors depend on the ramp terminal intersection, so typically this value would not be set globally. Lastly, the truck percentages for the ramp can also be set globally. When all the global inputs have been selected and defined, click the button to apply the global inputs. The next step in the analysis is to enter the segment specific data under the details tab. The top portion of this window allows the analyst to select which segment is being detailed. In this case, the first basic freeway segment is highlighted and the segment at the top of the page also indicates this is segment one. Under the geometric data he header, uh, the only input is to check the box by measured free flow speed because ODOT defines that as a default free flow speed be used. Um, because measured free flow speed has been toggled, the lane width and right side clearance values are not entered. Uh, if necessary, grade information for the segment would be provided. Uh, it would be, be provided here as well. Uh, provided all the other data was entered under the general or segments tab, the geomet geometric data section is complete. Moving down the page, the only input under the demand. Oh, it's starting to do that again. I don't know why. Second. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, he actually went into the office today to make sure he was on the hardwired connection there. So we're trying. Yeah, I'm not even, I'm just clicking the arrows. It's the only thing I've touched <laughs> the whole time. Uh, let's see. Well, let's try it again and see if. There, it's starting to stay there. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. The Peak hour factor and the total truck percentage may be changed on this screen, but they were likely set as part of the global factors. Uh, default values for adjustment factors should be used. Uh, next, we'll input details for the merge segment. The analyst may move from segment to segment by 
clicking on it in the diagram or by using the drop down menu at the top of the page. Provided the information has been entered in the general or segments tab, the analyst should be on, only be required to modify the number of lanes on the ramp. Select the side of the freeway from which the ramp merges and provide the length of acceleration lane. The acceleration lane length is measured from the painted nose of the gore to the end of the taper as illustrated here. Assuming that the other data has been input as part of the general or segments tabs, the only inputs under the demand data and adjustment factors headings are the merge demand volume and the ramp peak hour factor. Notice the freeway demand box is grayed out and cannot be changed under the merge segment analysis. If different from global factors, freeway total truck percentage and ramp total truck percentages can be entered. Again, the use of adjustment factors will be very limited on ODOT projects. The default values should be used. Uh, diverge segment inputs are nearly identical to merge segments. The number of ramp lanes should be specified as well as the side of the freeway and the ramp, the side of the free, freeway the ramp diverges from and provide the length of deceleration lane. Uh, the length of the deceleration lane is measured the same as an acceleration lane, beginning of taper to the painted nose of the gore. The only inputs uh, under demand data and adjustment factors for diverge segments are the diverge demand and the ramp peak hour factor. Again, notice how the freeway demand box is grayed out and cannot be changed on this screen. If different from the global factors, freeway total truck percentage and ramp total truck percentages can be entered. There are several inputs required for a weaving segment. First, under the freeway geometric data, the weaving configuration must be entered. In most cases, it'll be one-sided. Based on the number of lanes on the freeway and the weaving configuration, the number of maneuver lanes, minimum number of freeway to ramp lane changes, ramp to freeway lane changes and ramp to ramp lane changes will be automatically calculated by the program. The other input on this screen is the short length. The short length of a weaving section is measured between the channelized lines or barriers as shown here. This length is irrespective of the location of the painted nose of gore. Two weaving segments could be identical in length between painted gores but have different short lengths because one segment has longer channelizing lines than the other. This figure is not very clear, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, under the ramp geometric data, the number of lanes for both the on and off ramps should be entered. Uh, there are multiple volume inputs required under the demand data. The ramp to freeway, ramp to ramp, and freeway to ramp demand is required for analysis as well as their corresponding peak hour factors and total truck percentages. The other inputs should have been entered under the general uh, or segments tabs or our default values. Now that all the analysis inputs have been entered, we can view the results under the results tab. This tab shows the performance of each individual element similar to the details tab by clicking on the segment in the diagram or using the drop down box at the top of the page. Analysis results can be viewed by segment. A useful feature of the HCS Freeway Facilities module is its ability to provide graphical results. Here are the results for flow, speed, and density, and the level of service for the sample project. The colors are very helpful to visually see where slowdowns and bot bottlenecks may be occurring. As detailed in the OATS manual, the results from the HCS analysis must be included in the appendix of the analysis report. Uh, there are several reporting options under the report tab. Uh, the default report in the, is, is the freeway facilities report. This report should be included as part of the appendix. Uh, results for all the segments are included in this, in this report as well as overall facility reports. Graphs of the volume, speed, and density distributions are also provided. The reports for the individual segments must also be included in the study appendix. These reports are obtained by clicking switch to segment report at the bottom of the report window. Uh, to change the segment being reported, click on the drop down menu uh, on the bottom of the page. Um, one thing that should be noted with the analysis was the message that was included as part of the freeway facilities report. It said that oversaturated conditions exist in boundary time period one results may not be reliable. 
uh, and, and consider expanding analysis in time and or space to resolve this warning. So as detailed in the OATS manual, only single period analysis is being used for ODOT projects at this time. Therefore, this error is unresolvable and the results are acceptable for ODOT analyses. However, the analyst should be aware of the effects of this oversaturation has on results from the no build and build alternatives. Assume a proposed solution involved adding an auxiliary lane between the North Broadway on-ramp and the Henderson Road off-ramp. This segment would be analyzed as a weave. Therefore, there will only be seven segments in the no build in the build condition compared to the nine in the in the no build. However, the length of the project is constant between alternatives. So, looking at the flow graphics, it is apparent that the no build condition in the no build condition that a bottleneck exists at the southern end of the project. This bottleneck is metering the traffic able to reach the northern limits of the study area. As a result, the operations in in the northernmost segment or segment nine in the no build condition is LOSD, despite that the demand to capacity ratio is 0 0.97. In the build condition, the bottleneck is removed and the full demand can reach the northernmost segment or segment seven. As a result, the segment operates at a level of service E. Uh, while no geometric modifications were made to the segment, there is more traffic arriving at the segment during the analysis period, which results in a lower level of service. The demand to capacity ratio is 0 0.97, the same as the no build. The fact that the LOS has lowered is an indication that the build condition has improved upstream operations. The fact that the build condition did not receive the error regarding the oversaturated conditions is also an indication that the build condition is an improvement over the no build. So care should be taken when comparing the overall facility results when at least one alternative is oversaturated. Because of the bottleneck and the no build condition, the downstream segments operate with a higher speed and lower density than the build condition. However, the overall facility LOS can be compared. For this example, the facility LOS improved from LOS F in the no build to LOS E in the build. The configurations covered in the facilities example uh, cover the most encountered configurations. Please contact ORE for situations not covered by the training. Uh, we will provide future OATS updates to sh show those situations. For more information, refer to the OATS manual and the online training modules. Signalized intersection analysis is covered in section 6.2.2.1 of the OATS and it's accompany, uh, accompanied by uh, training videos that go into detail on creating a new file, inputting data, optimization, and reporting. Signal timing optimization has changed from how ODOT previously balanced approach delays in HCS. Um, HCS contains a robust traffic signal timing opti optimization tool set that includes optimization of cycle length, phase splits, and offsets for a variety of objective functions. While there is a quick optimization function for ODOT projects, the full optimization process, process should be used. For the purposes of ODOT project, project's balance delay should be selected from the drop-down box. The analyst can then select what features should be optimized, cycle lengths, splits, and offsets, or some combination. In some cases, the analyst may not want to change the cycle length because the intersection is part of a larger coordinated system and the cycle length must remain the same. Um, and I do want to add that using the balance delay sometimes gives weird results, um, and we have had on recent projects, better luck using uh, choosing the overall delay and then hand adjusting to meet OATS requirements for V over C ratios and LOS. So we may want to update this step um, and the following steps in the future, but as of right now, that's what the manual says. A minimum of 50 generations is required for ODOT projects and using the default of 200 is acceptable. Signal optimization is an iterative process and the number of generations represents how many iterations the program will run before deciding on the optimal signal timings based on the objective function. In many cases, it is acceptable and even desired to set the minimum number of generations higher than 50. Typically, their uh, three or four optimization runs may be necessary to get the best results as each run begins with the previous results and further refines them. 
Once the inputs for all intersections uh, being optimized are entered into the program, the analyst should press the green start button. The new window like the one on the left here will open showing the progress of the optimization. When the optimization analysis is complete, the window like the one on the right will open and will provide the level of improvement provided by the optimized timings. Uh, hitting save will populate the optimized signal timings into the phasing inputs under the prim primary input data. For this example, the optimization terminated because the maximum number of generations was reached uh, and not because the optimization reached convergence. Uh, when this occurs, the analyst should save the timings and run the optimization again until convergence is reached. The, fi the final timings and reports should be reviewed to ensure that the timings cannot be tweaked by a few seconds so that all movements are operating under capacity or at acceptable levels of service. When the analysis is complete, the report can be printed. Uh, one report should be printed for each intersection. For ODOT projects, the full report must be submitted. To generate the correct report under the Reports tab, the full report should be selected. This report contains the input data, the results summary, and the graphical report summary. One of the benefits of building a network in, HC in HCS is that it can easily be converted to Transmodeler. By clicking on the Transmodeler icon shown here under Edit on the toolbar, the file is easily converted to Transmodeler. Uh, Transmodeler will open into a simulation run. And the analyst should be careful when using this conversion and should check all lane configurations in Transmodeler to make sure they converted correctly and that the geometry of the lanes is smooth and realistic. There are a number of additional resources for guidance in analyzing signalized intersections in HCS, including the HCM, OATS Manual Section 6.2.2.1, the OATS Training Video, the HCS Help Manual, and the McTrans Video Tutorials. Chapter 7 covers traffic simulation using Transmodeler. So ODOT has adopted Transmodeler as its primary simulation software. Chapter 7 provides a significant amount of detail blending both general transmodeler how-to guidance with ODOT-specific standards and expectations. Chapter 7 provides detailed information on model development, file organization, and network coding, traffic control and management, road classification and naming streets and centroids, superlinks and selection sets, demand input development, calibration and validation, output and performance measures, and presentation requirements. Uh, How-to videos, which can be found in the training video playlist on ORE Studies page, cover in detail coding a network, importing from external file formats, exporting from statewide database, uh, which the database can be also be found on ORE's webpage, uh, um, road editing, uh, covering freeway intersection and routabouts, turning movements, multi-period demand, intersection operations, isolated and corridor signal optimization, road classes, vehicle classes, and vehicle departure rates. So those are all on the website currently. And at the time of this web webinar, the following uh, videos are still being developed and will be added to the playlist when complete. Overview of the user interface, importing cube networks, calibration validation, and output uh, reports. And here is the link where you can find all of those videos. Chapter 8 of the OATS covers the presentation of results. Traffic analysis results can be presented in the following three formats, tabular format, graphical format, animation, which is for micro-simulation micro analysis only. Regardless of the format, the results should be presented in a manner that is concise and understandable to the intended audience. Um, this, is a, this is a sample alternatives comparison table, which allows the reviewer to clearly understand the operational differences between alternatives rather than flipping through multiple report pages for comparisons. This table is less detailed in regard to specific movements and measures of effectiveness at the intersection, but allows the reviewer an easy visual comparison of the intersection results for multiple alternatives. For interchange modification study and justification studies, the operational results should be graphically represented. Uh, information on the graphic should include the segment number, analysis type, location, level of service, and demand over capacity ratio. This graphic is a sample of the type of operational analysis re results that can be developed for these types of studies. Geometric data should also be presented in interchange modification and justification studies. Information should include 
the uh, number of mainline lanes on ramp and off ramp, off ramp number of lanes, merge, diverge, or weave configurations, labeled interchanges, ramp metering, speed limits, and a clear distinction between no build and build conditions. Uh, this distinction could include the build conditions shown in red or with the no build conditions shown with dotted lines and the build is shown with solid lines. In this sample graphic, the changes in the build condition are shown in red. For interchange operation studies, feasibility studies, corridor studies, and traffic impact studies, the graphical rep, uh, presentation is typically not necessary to illustrate the operational results. To illustrate the geometric data for the overall network, a figure should be generated that includes a stick figure of the study area, which could include an aerial image as the background, street names, speed limits, distance between intersections, and a clear distinction between the no build and build conditions. Uh, refer to chapter eight of the OATS for more details. In order to streamline review and to allow for replication of the analysis, the calibration and validation process, and resulting changes to the base model should be documented. The documentation should provide justification for any changes of the values of the default parameters in support of statistics, which compares field measured and calibration measures of effectiveness. The model uh, development documentation form must be completed for all complex type projects. Also, any standard type project where recommended ODOT default values described in the OATS manual were changed will require the completion of this form. For standard type projects that did not change any recommended ODOT default values, the documentation form is not required. However, a statement should be included with the traffic analysis discussion that no default values were changed. The completed documentation form should be submitted with the traffic analysis submission. The reviewer checklist is used to help ensure quality control on all ODOT analyses. The purpose of the quality control reviews is to ver verify that the parameters and assumptions match the study requirements, analyses are performed appropriately, models are properly calibrated, and the results are reasonable. Additionally, this checklist will help ensure that all required files are submitted as part of the review. The reviewer checklist should be filled out by the consultant team prior to, to the submittal to ODOT. By completing this form, the consultant team is ensuring that the model has been reviewed. In summary, there are two forms that help uh, document the modeling and analysis process when com completing ODOT analyses. The, mo the model de development documentation details uh, the model parameters that deviate from the default values and the calibration and validation process. And the reviewer checklist ensures quality control on ODOT analyses. Both of these forms are found on the ODOT website, uh, linked previously in this slide presentation, um, with more details provided in Chapter 9 of the ODOT OATS Manual. As a reminder, the OATS Manual Model Documentation Form Reviewer Checklist, Scoping Form, Link to Training Videos, State of Ohio Transmodeler Database File can all be found on Roadway Engineering's Studies webpage. Um, we plan to update the OATS as needed every January and July based on ORE's experiences in enforcing OATS standards, as well as any feedback we get from districts, consultants, and locals. And finally, the contact information for ORE's studies engineers can also be found here, um, and they should be contacted for any questions or feedback regarding the OATS, and their contact information can be found on the website. Um, so Victoria, Adam, I'm done with these slides and it looks like we have a few minutes left for what I'm assuming to be a whole lot of questions. There were definitely questions that came in. So maybe if Adam wants to pick the ones that are best to be answered via audio and then he can just start going over them with you until we get to 1130. Yeah. And as Victoria said, she, she can download the whole um, message box and, and we can send out responses to all of the questions um, at a later date as well. Here's an easy one, I hope. Um, well, actually, Adam just answered that one. <clears throat> it disappeared from my screen. It was an easy one. <laughs> yeah, Brett, and, uh, one of the questions is, uh, do you have them open right now? 
Uh, he can't see them. You're the only sure. one that can see them. Oh, I'm the only one that can see it. Okay. Good. I was just going to have you answer it because you worked on the project. But um, uh -oh. it says on, on slide 26, discussing HCS analysis for ATDM. No, oh, hold on. Questions are coming in. I can't see the old one. Do you want me just to send that one over to? I'll send it over to Brenton. Okay. Yeah, if it'll pop up in his chat. Yeah. I just send it over to him. I wasn't sure what, uh, I believe it was transmaller, but I'll let you answer that one for the hard shoulder running. Brent, you should have that in your question box now. Okay. On slide 26, discussing HCS analysis for ATDM strategies, hard shoulder running is also an ATDM strategy. Just curious if HCS was used for this improvement and any specific findings. Uh, yes, I, I do believe um, HCS was used used for that analysis. So that slide is slightly inaccurate for the ATDM strategies. Um, anything, uh, I guess the short answer is yes, the hard shoulder running for that situation was, was used um, to evaluate that strategy. We did use um, Transmuller for the end of that corridor where it tied into the 270 interchange and going northbound because um, there was a lot more weaving and interactions there, but for um, kind of a simple free, freeway facilities analysis, uh, HS could be could be used there. So yep, that's a good good comment. Well, the next one, uh, Brent, is uh, have you developed a default Ohio specific parameters file that should be used in transmodeler analysis, similar to what NCDOT developed? And I guess I can answer that. We do not currently have that at this time. Mm -hmm. um, we do have in the OATS, we have some parameters that, you know, for Ohio, that are Ohio specific that have changed. And um, I believe Brenton, that was sent out on like a, in an email with all the parameters that were changed to local or to anyone subscribing to the L&D volume one. Yeah, yep. And so you might have that in your email, and it, it's there's uh, various parameters that are changed from the defaults in the OATS. Um, and that next one's a statement. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, Victoria, I'm not sure how. Will they just submit them, or is it? Over. I sent uh, another one over to Brenton because it, oh. I know you've got a ton sitting in your box. Um, let's see. To avoid yellow trap to up and implementing flashing yellow arrows for lagging left turn lanes, such as those used in Michigan. Um, I, I think traffic operations, and I wish they could, I think Charlie or uh, Fisher was actually in this presentation or maybe some, some others, but I think they just adopted that. I think ODOT is now doing that. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I thought I saw a recent uh, email that came out that, that ODOT is using the yellow flashing arrows. Charlie Fisher is now over in the panelist area, so if he wants to unmute and answer that, oh, wow. he's welcome to. I just moved him over. Nothing like putting him on the spot. <laughs> um, maybe while he's getting set up, is there another question? Oh, he doesn't have his audio set up. Sorry, guys. You know, there have been so many of them, and we only have a couple of minutes left. It might be best at this point in time, like you mentioned, that we have a, an Excel spreadsheet actually we download in the background um, where we have all the questions that everyone has asked, and it's attributed to you if you asked it. So I'll provide that to our presenters who have done an excellent job this morning on some very technical information, and then they can get back with a Q&A document or maybe even reach out directly if it's more project specific. So. Yep, sorry, sorry for taking up the whole time. There's a lot of material to cover, um, but, but hopefully the follow-up responses to questions help, helps uh, everybody out. Absolutely. And the certificates will be going out later today. Please have patience, everyone. The, the intern's on vacation, so it's going to be me sending them to you, but I will get them out. So thank you, everyone, for your time this morning on the webinar. We really appreciate it. And we will make certain that the follow-up video recording link, as long as it's successful, goes out to you as well. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you.